presentation here. It's my first time in Montreal. Very happy to be here and to interact with you all. Today, I'm going to try to give a direct and explicit answer to the type of question Stephen Harnad brought up time and again in connection with inviting us to the Summer Institute. Namely, what qualifies something for the status of being conscious, as opposed to simply performing a function or being operational? Because our field currently dwells in a pre-paradigmatic phase of development, researchers often differ in their commitments to first principles. So I will devote a considerable portion of my talk to preliminaries involving different naturalistic ways of accounting for the conscious state. I will discuss them under three headings. Additive-based, complexity-based, and format-based. Only in the first of these approaches does our host's challenge of but what makes it conscious enjoy a home game advantage. So let me start with that one. It traces its pedigree at least as far back as John Locke and his conviction that it is, and I quote him, impossible to conceive that ever bare in cogitative matter should produce a thinking intelligent being. That conviction was, was part of Locke's argument for the necessary existence of God. Modern progress in understanding how particular forms of organization of bare in cogitative matter sustain not only life but a variety of cognitive processes now understood in neural terms tempted some thinkers to conceive that the conscious mind itself might indeed find an explanation in particular forms of organized matter. Enter the American philosopher Thomas Nagel, doing battle against what he called the, the recent wave of reductionist euphoria, the recent wave of reductionist euphoria. In his 1974 essay, he proposed that all the successes notwithstanding, the fact of consciousness itself will elude this kind of treatment for the simple reason that an objectifying treatment must fail to account for the ineluctably subjective nature of the conscious state. He did not spell out the nature of this subjectivity except in the vaguest of terms, but cloaked it instead in the obscure formula of a something it is like to be conscious. And I quote, the fact that an organism has conscious experience at all means basically that there is something it is like to be that organism. On a generous interpretation of what this is supposed to mean, it has been taken to distinguish conscious beings from non-conscious ones, such as rocks. But of course, it does no such thing. There are all kinds of things it is like to be a rock, such as being located in space and in time, having mass, being relatively solid, and so on. And also, of course, that of being utterly without knowledge or experience of any of these properties or attributes. Nevertheless, those things it is like to be a rock can be registered by instruments and can even become conscious, but then only for an external observer, not the rock itself. Thus we see that Nagel's famous something it is like must be construed as something it is like in the sense of being experienced from a first person perspective. The, the phrase itself, in other words, is just another name for the conscious state. The putatively neutral characterization of that state is, in other words, no more than a tautology. However, instead of being recognized as a tautology, this something it is like has caused endless mischief by being taken in the sense of a property, a distinctive qualitative something possessed by the conscious state and by it alone, as an inherently identifying attribute, elusive yet crucial to any explanation of the nature of the state it is taken to predicate. As such, it has taken on a life of its own and assumed many guises, such as the putative feel of consciousness. A truly bizarre notion, since any feel it might, that might be proper to it would have to be a content of the conscious state to be experienced. And a content of the conscious state cannot define that state itself being contained in it. So-called qualia are derivatives of this global feel by differentiating it into separate fields of any and all conceivable specific contents of the conscious state, and obviously are even worse definientia for the same reason. Now, those who, despite Nagel's warnings, set out to find a physicalist that is a neural explanation of the conscious state, but retain the erroneous, erroneous belief that his something it is like is anything more than another name for the conscious state, this error has licensed a quest for an obligatory extra ingredient that must be added to any mechanism to give it the mysterious something it is like to qualify as conscious. 
as David Chalmers put it in his latter-day elaboration of the Nagel position, to account for conscious experience, we need an extra ingredient in the explanation. That extra ingredient is what motivates my name additive and additive-based for the approach. So bids for that extra ingredient, we have them here. They span the gamut from calcium waves in neuroglia to gamma oscillations to electromagnetic fields to superpositions of the quantum wave function and to, I blush to say it, a primitive built into the foundations of our universe, which would seem to be a worthy modern-day standing for Locke's almighty God as the source of thinking intelligent beings. In practice, of course, the typical use of the Nagel-inspired additive approach is to provide a simple means of wholesale dismissal of any and all attempts at a neural account of the conscious state. For any proposal of this kind, additivists can always pose the challenge, ah, that's the neural mechanism, but that's just neurons firing. So what makes the mechanism conscious? If you believe in the Nagel-inspired approach of consciousness as an additive, that's the end of the matter. Yet, as I have been at pains to explain, that approach is built on an error, which makes of a tautology an added property or attribute. So if you avoid that mistake, the challenge loses its force. What is more, if you avoid that mistake, the door is open to a neural account of the conscious state that is built on a better understanding of its subjective first-person nature than that captured in Nagel's awkward something it is like. The generic alternative to an additive-based approach is to seek answers along the same lines that have led to understanding in other areas of the biology of life. There, the key to progress has always been unraveling how bare incogitative matter must be organized so as to perform the functions of living beings. Witness metabolism with its Krebs cycle and associated metabolic pathways that sustain the fire of life. On the left, here in the figure. Here's the Krebs cycle, and here is a miniature Krebs cycle with all the metabolic pathways that are attached to it in graph theory analysis. Or what about reproduction here on the right with the double multiply coil DNA spiral and its associated protein manufacturing machinery, all strictly bound to structural templates right here. Or what about neuroanatomy as the framework of neural causality? which is structured through and through from the ultra-structural level to the gross subdivisions of the brain. Here a sample at intermediate, intermediate levels of structural scale, namely cortex-like laminar circuitry in the roof of the midbrain. I call theories that frame their answers in terms of principles of structural organization for structural approaches to the conscious state. So to the additive approaches, we can add structural approaches. They have this in common, that they fasten on one or several manifest attributes of the conscious state as, as its defining property and attempt to account for that property in terms of the functional organization of neural circuitry. One current bid for such an account is the complexity proposal of Tononi and colleagues. It proceeds from the intuitively based assumption that the conscious state has high informational capacity achieved through combining integration with differentiation and looks for a mechanism to account for this assumed property. A structure that does so by exhibiting small world graph theoretic properties is the cerebral cortex, for which Tononi and colleagues have devised quantitative informational measures, the latest one called phi. However, small world graph theoretic complexity exists in other objects of nature, such as our metabolic pathways, without for that reason rendering them conscious. Even, its cortical, even in its cortical version, the property of combining integration with differentiation really is a statement about conscious contents rather than about the conscious state, and even then pertains more to successive contents over time rather than in the moment, at least as originally formulated. Moreover, the innumerable partitionings of the graph theory approach offer no natural basis for the unique partitioning required to place all conscious contents in relation to a perspectival vantage point, which is the deepest defining feature of the first-person perspective. My own guess is that cortical small world organization, organizational complexity serves cortical information storage and retrieval, for which it would seem ideally suited. But even if one is skeptical about the complexity proposal itself, 
it is worth noting that its proponents can justifiably answer the but what makes it conscious challenge by replying, we just told you, complexity of this particular kind. Because according to that approach, a sufficiently high score on a particular graph theoretic information measure defines the conscious state. So nothing needs to be added beyond that, except detail. After Crick and Watson pointed out that the hydrogen bonds joined in the two DNA strands provide a convenient mechanism of replication, it would be most peculiar to ask, but how does it replicate? Rather, you delve into the details to see if it works. Whether the complexity approach has correctly identified the structural crux of the conscious state is a separate matter, and I think not. But the same immunity in principle to the what makes it conscious challenge holds for the other structural approaches, which I call format-based ones. Format-based approach is proposed that the implementation of a conscious state requires a particular arrangement, topology, confirmation, or format on the part of the implementing mechanism, rather than a quantitatively graded measure of its information capacity as such. One such proposal is global workspace theory. Whereas the complexity approach relies on the intuitively conceived informational capacity of the conscious state, Global workspace theory focuses on its empirically demonstrated quite limited capacity to entertain multiple targets of interest simultaneously, at least as assessed with, by post hoc report. Global workspace theory proposes that potential conscious contents originate in non-conscious special, in non-conscious special purpose operations, which alone or in combination compete for access to a limited capacity working memory with short time horizons, the global workspace. Its contents are conscious and are broadcast back to the full complement of unconscious special purpose operations whose specialized capacities thereby come to serve the winner of the moment. However, as in the case of the complexity approach, the workspace approach provides little in the way of an intrinsic point of support for the first person perspective. Bars touches on this issue late in his magnificent 1988 book where he adds a self as an enduring dominant context to the context hierarchy of his model, model number seven to be exact. This appears more by way of an afterthought, however, than as an intrinsic feature of the workspace conception itself, which does perfectly well without it. Presumably because the original workspace logic of Selfridge had no need for such a feature. It was designed to implement pattern recognition by sets of feature detectors rather than the conscious state. I come then to my own corner of this classification, and I call it global best estimate theory. And I've painted myself into a corner, as you can see down here, so I better get out of it. So uh, it literally revolves around the pivotal relation between a perspectival vantage point and the conscious and conscious contents. The subject-centered first-person point of view that defines the conscious state is all too often identified with our so-called internal world. This typically is taken to mean things like imagination, thoughts in one's head, and feelings stirring in one's breast. But as we, should, as we shall see, the first-person perspective is designed, de- defined with far more precision in our sensory perception of the external world than it, than it is for the often ill-defined and elusive contents of what we call our inner world. Sensory awareness, say seeing, not only provides us with robust conscious percepts, such as the sight of an audience or storm clouds gathering on the horizon, it places them for us in a magnificently organized macrostructure, the format of our ordinary conscious waking reality, which by no means corresponds directly to the physical reality we negotiate with its help, as depicted at the grossest level in its bird's eye view of a human observer. We are looking from above at a human head, H here in the middle, placed at the intersection of three railroad tracks, one, two, three, extending indefinitely on an infinite plane, looking out over the plane through a cyclopean aperture with a horizontal extent of about 180 degrees, a little more than 180 degrees, a human observer experiences a foreshortened version of physical reality in which parallel lines converge perspectively to the artificial horizon of experienced space, here marked in white with the parallel lines of the railroad track converging to the experienced horizon of the conscious 
space. This perceptual space is organized around the perceptual ego center, E here, serving as the origin of its perspectival geometry and ever-present pivot of the first-person sensory perspective, depicted in the classic drawing by Ernst Mach from the end of the 18th century. This is Mach's first-person monocular view of his studio through his left eye, meticulously rendered so as to highlight features of our visual world we normally ignore because of their ever-present over-familiarity. Here, at the edge of the no-man's land of the intraorbital space, is the edge of uh, Mach's eyebrow. Here below is the edge of his mustache. And in this left eye view, on the right, here is his nose. This is Mach's nose. And here we can see that Mach is a smoker, because a cigarette extends from beneath his no nose here, a lit cigarette. With both eyes open, instead of one eye as here, with both eyes open, the nose disappears altogether, and we get this cyclopean aperture through which we look out upon the world. Typically, we are not even conscious of the oval frame of our vis visual field, but think we are experiencing this. Whereas the slightest bit of attention to the matter, or perimetry, will show that in fact we are looking out onto the world from inside an aperture so powerfully caught in Mach's drawing. The point from which Mach is looking can be pinpointed exactly by a psychophysical mapping procedure that was developed by Ewald Hering in the 1870s. It can be used by anybody to empirically determine their own visual ego center using only a large piece of cardboard and some fiduciary pins. My own vantage point, empirically assessed in this manner, turns out to be located 4.5 centimeters right behind the bridge of my nose. Okay? Shown here enter on somebody else's structural MRI image of a horizontal slice through the human head. Now this place, this place is the place from which I am looking at you. <laughs> Seeing this image, I hope that you're asking yourself, but how on earth is it possible to look out upon the world through an empty cyclopean aperture from that point inside the head which obviously surrounded on all sides by biological tissues. Bone, in blue here, sinuses in white, connective tissue, blood vessels, and so on. A good question, whose answer, in fact, will turn out to be quite simple and straightforward, provided you get your basics right. So let's start from the beginning. The brain's task in orienting a physical body in a physical world by no means resembles that of the neurophysiologist trying to determine how that brain works, as in this standard lab situation. Here we have a screen, stimulus on the screen, cat fixating the screen, electrode in the brain, amplifier, and here, is, here are the different responses of the cell, that single cell, to repeated 200 uh, uh, stimulus trials on a raster. The neurophysiologist's task is to correlate what happens on the screen here with what happens in the brain displayed here. Demanding as that task might be, it is dwarfed by the predicament the brain faces in its solitary confinement inside an opaque and sturdy skull. Unlike the physiologist, the brain has no independent access to the screen. It knows nothing of the surrounding world except what arrives inside its bony prison in the form of the chattering of sensory nerves. Therefore, it has nothing to correlate that chattering with except other chattering neural activity, which I illustrate by plunging that brain into the darkness inside its skull where it actually lives. Here's the chattering neural activity. Now, this situation would be hopeless were it not for the fact that the brain has more than one single cell to draw on, and in its sensory systems, its many neurons are arranged in such a way that neighboring cells respond to neighboring locations on the receptor surface, like the retina. So here we have a set of locations in the brain that all respond to neighboring locations on the retina. And that creates a spatial, an actual spatial map of the retina in the brain. And so you get actual images in the brain of the pattern of activity on the retina, as shown here for the visual cortex of a macaque 
fixating the center of the scintillating image. It faced on the screen just before it was killed for 2-deoxyglucose autoradiography. Here is two tells from 1982. Two tells, macaque is fixating F here. This is flashing on the screen, and there were flashing on the macaque's retina. And here is the image of the activity in visual cortex caught just as the monkey was dying by the 2-deoxyglucose uh, method. And this is obviously a, trans a direct spatial transform of this, what is on the retina. And the transform is shown here. It's a pseudo-logarithmic transform. But notice that I have said nothing about these images being conscious or, 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 or perceived in any conscious manner. I assume they are not. One reason I think they are not is that a neural map like this can at best, at best represent what is on the retina. But, but that is not the brain's task on the sensory side of its operations. It needs to know what it, what it is in the physical universe that causes the retinal image. And that is an entirely different order of problem because that is the problem of source reconstruction. And such problems are riddled with so-called inverse problems at every turn. Here's an eyeball. Here's a retinal image. This single retinal image can be caused by an infinity of objects out in the physical world that differ in size among themselves, small ones and big ones. They differ in distance from the eyeball, short and long. And they differ in orientation. This is just three of, of that, three of them, but actually an infinity of objects out here can cause this identical retinal image. What is true for, for distance, size, and orientation in vision is also true for illumination, reflectance, transmittance, texture, shading, contour, motion, binocular disparity, solid shape, object grouping, and scene segmentation. All of these are loaded with inverse problems and must be solved. So this concatenation of inverse problems loads the input to the brain with sensory ambiguity from beginning to end. Further ambiguity is generated by the sensory consequences of bodily mo movement, which mix information emanating from the surrounding world with sensory changes produ produced by body movement, illustrated in this most elementary fashion here. Again, we have an eyeball. The eyeball is fixating here. A stimulus moves from here to here causing retinal image mo movement from here to here. In this case, the eyeball is not fixed. It's moving, actively moving. The stimulus is fixed, leading to the identical image motion on the retina from here to here. Here, the eyeball is moving passively, pushed by your, by your finger. Note the anatomical realism here with bones inside the finger. <coughs> uh, eye is fixating here. The, 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 uh, uh, the eye is moving from here to here. The stimulus is fixed. In this case, and in this case, we are experiencing stimulus mo movement, but not in this case. But the retinal image is identical. Retinal, identical retinal image movement corresponds to very different realities, compounding the inherent ambiguity of the information the brain has, to, has no choice but to work on and with. We are still a long way off, in other words, from even an elementary account of the structural features of perception that the brain manifestly equips us with in presenting us with the surrounding world. So it has to, to, to do that, the brain has to solve two problems. The world has to be reconstructed from a retinal snapshot, and the reconstructed world has to be seen from a viewpoint. In fact, the brain's tangle of entangled sensory and motor inverse problems is a control theory nightmare. Our massive cortical apparatus is dedicated to resolving that nightmare by disambiguating the many dimensions of its source reconstruction problem. The secret of cortical success in this regard appears to be a policy of honesty. For the first time in evolution, uh, a biological organ started representing things honestly. Namely, to represent ambiguity as ambiguity, which means representing it probabilistically. This allows the cortex to bring the powerful tools of probabilistic inference and cue combination to bear on source reconstruction. Time does not allow me to go into detail, but essentially this strategy involves suspending decision-making as far as possible in favor of wide-ranging provisional transcortical interactions in search, of, in search of cues and fits and priors wherever they can be found, even in other modalities, as in the McGurk effect that we saw this morning, uh, demonstrated on the screen with some, with some technical problems. Such a strategy is simplified by making probability density distributions the common functional format of the cortex. 
as proposed long ago by Anderson and Van Essen, by Shadlin and Newsom, and more recently modeled by Puget and colleagues, among others. Yet such a strategy of suspended commitments cannot be sustained longer than to the very next gaze movement. One typically happens every few hundred milliseconds. Because every gaze movement changes the initial conditions of an ongoing disambiguation process and thus renders it obsolete. The disambiguation process terminates in a gaze movement and accordingly must issue in a decision about that gaze movement's target. Such a decision will remain suboptimal unless based on a global best estimate of the brain's current sensory situation, which means that the cortical probability distributions, the many cortical maybes, must be collapsed to a definitive global estimate, resolving all the ambiguities in a temporary global best fit. Much speaks for pre precipitating such a global best estimate extracortically in order to minimize interference with ongoing cortical interactions. This is feasible because the global estimate can be represented far more compactly, even orders of magnitude more compactly, than the neural probability distributions on which it is based, which are very information in intensive. Even so, to do so within the span of a couple of hundred milliseconds is a tall order. Putting a premium on exploiting every available cluster of correlated variances, every regularity, and every invariance embedded in the cortical probability distributions. The most massive and general of these resources is the fact that all the brain's information, all the brain's information streams in one way or another originate in or are directed at a multi-jointed, mobile, physical body interacting with a complex surrounding physical world. All extra receptors are affixed to the surface of that body and move with it. And all the muscles of that body that move that body are attached to the bones articulated at those joints. The global best estimate accordingly should be cast in a format that allows the entangled variances issuing from the interaction of the receptors carried on a multi-jointed moving body with a complex world to be conveniently disaggregated and allocated to, allocated to their proper sources, that is, decorrelated. Let the brain then be equipped with a neural model of body-world interactions, a kind of neural reality model that partitions its rampant variance into its body and world components, because these, in fact, are the major veridical sources of those entangled variances. Moreover, a disproportionate amount of that variance is accounted for by the principal set of movements the body employs in negotiating its environment, namely gaze movements. They consist of rotatory displacements of the eyes in their orbits with rotatory displacements of the head on its cervical pivot. By casting the global format of the neural reality model as a nesting of a neural model of the body within a neural model of the world, the model can exploit the simplicity of rotation-based coordinate transformations for decorrelation purposes by letting all global sensory movement be reflected in movements of the neural body alone relative to a stationary neural world as illustrated in cartoon fashion in this next slide with a, for the head alone. A physical gaze movement causes the image of the world to sweep across the physical retina, while here in the reality model, the world remains still and stationary while the global retinal movement is represented as a rotary swiveling movement of the head, indicated by these arrows here. World remains stationary, head is moving inside the reality model, inside the brain. Only, the egocentric <clears throat> only if the egocentric geometry, here we have the egocentric geometry with its rays extending out, only if the egocentric geometry that holds these two partitionings of the reality space together, the world and the, and the body partition, even only if that ego center is, uh, has its origin inside the head. Does it deliver the convenience of rota rotation-based coordinate transformations? I got a little uh, sidetracked here. Only if the egocentric geometry that holds these two partitionings of the reality space together has its origin placed inside the head of, rep of the representation. I'm sorry, I'll try that again, okay? Third time now. 
Only if the egocentric geometry that holds these two partitionings of the reality space together, only if it has its origin placed inside the head representation of that space does it deliver the convenience of rotation-based coordinate transformation. <laughs> okay? it gotta ha it, the, the origin of the coordinate system got to be inside the head to allow the convenience of rotation-based coordinates because speed is of the essence here. Moreover, it is the central location of this ego center is crucial. In this central location, the ego center has equal and ubiquitous access to both body and world zones, and thus is ideally placed to settle synergies and conflicts in their combined states, provided it is equipped with suitable mutually inhibitory decision circuitry. So I have therefore added that decision circuitry here. Such decision making is, however, not a matter of empty best fits between prevailing constellations of body and world. The brain's next move must, be serve, must serve the body's needs, monitor, monitored by the brain's motivational systems. Their signals can be introduced into the reality model as, a neural, as neural biasing signals acting on a decision axis. If you represent them here in this empty space, there is nothing represented between the body wall and the decision axis at the, at the center of the head. If you intru, in, introduce the biasing signals here, you're utilizing this empty space. So I have added them in the next slide. Here you have the brain's motivational system. systems. They pipe their output into the decision space and, and let them act as biasing signals on the decision mechanism at the center, which is mutual inhibitory. What we have arrived at then, by simply following the requirements imposed on the brain by its solitary confinement inside an opaque skull, is a neural mechanism housed in a compact subspace of the brain featuring a stabilized world space surrounding a mobile body as its central object held together in a single space by a coordinate system whose origin is lodged inside the head representation of that mobile body. A coordinate origin which at the same time serves as a decision-making nexus for that body's next move in pursuit of its motivationally determined goals. What I have just summarized in this complex sentence as the solution to the brain's control problem should sound somewhat familiar because it literally describes the global features of our sensory consciousness. All that remains for me to do is to suggest that what we call our self is this ego-centered decision mechanism that serves as a functional pivot of the brain's neural reality model. We ourselves are its central pivot, which has nothing to do with any self-image, but everything to do with a vantage point presupposed by every perceived image. That would mean, if this is true, that would mean that this very real world that surrounds us on all sides is actually the neural model of the world inside the brain's reality space. And this body, which we can see and touch and move, would be the neural model of the body inside, of, neural model of the physical body inside the brain's reality space. inside whose neural skin a variety of motivational signals acts, act as tens tensional fields in various vaguely defined body locations, such as fear gripping your heart or butterflies in your stomach. The reason these objects of our perception are present to us in the relation define, defining the conscious state is this simple circumstance that they are parts of the very neural reality space for which we ourselves occupy the... <coughs> the origin of coordinates uh, or coordinate system center that holds body and world together in that space and as an intrinsically asymmetric perspectival manner. To summarize, here is the nested ontology in its entirety. There is a physical world. In that world is a physical body. Inside that physical body there is a physical brain. All of this is forever cloaked in total, utter unconsciousness. Inside that brain there is a neural reality model divided into the neural world and the neural body nested around the ego center at the, in the center of the head. This is the locus of conscious experience in the brain 
and nothing else. I have flown very fast over complex terrain, so if this seems a bit abstract, let me finish by taking you back exactly 40 years to a drawing I made early in the development of our interest in the conscious state. I call it two worlds meeting in a box. Everything drawn in black here is physical universe, forever cloaked in the dark shroud of unconsciousness. The haphazard manner of drawing here is intended to indicate all the forms of matter and energy to which we are insensitive, infrared, cosmic rays, radio waves, and so on. Into this landscape, I have released a, a robot equipped with a camera on top for navigation purposes. Its output, the output of the camera, is piped into the navigation equipment, which includes a stabilized visual world display such as I described for the human brain. The screen here is the stabilized world display, which is part of its guidance system for camera and wheels. Translated to our own circumstances with full egocentric nested coordinate space, the contents of the screen, everything in color here, reflects only those aspects of the world within the sensitivity of our receptors, which is why this looks clearer than that. These contents of the screen are the contents of our conscious state. An ever-present part of those contents is this blue object here. It reflects that part of the physical vehicle that is within the field of view of the physical camera and corresponds, in other words, to what we call our body. This is our body, not this. Our entire conscious life in its sensory aspects unfolds in here and consists in t essentially of various ways of moving this about within that. This moves about in that. Here is the same thing a bit updated for a single additional point I want to make. Here's a neighborhood uh, in infrared with cosmic ray showers coming down and ions floating about in the air, all these things we don't experience. Here is the rover coming into the neighborhood. At a distance, it sees a big part of the neighborhood, both the houses and the tree in between. As the rover approaches this house, that house starts filling the screen. And as the rover approaches even closer, the garage store starts filling the screen. At the point when the rover makes contact with the garage door, the touch sensors on the front bumper of the rover activate and pipe their message into the screen, which is obviously multimodal. At that very point, the garage door prevents further progress of the rover, so everything fits. No table-thumping reality test is to avail against this argument and this account. You know, the, 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 the philosopher, this is reality. Well, at the point, at the point when, the, when the rover bumps into the garage door, the touch sensors activate. There simply is no way to discover from inside of here that this is not the only reality there is. The only really real reality, except, of course, for one little detail. And I come to the conclusion of my talk namely the ego center conundrum. Remember the question how it is that we can look out upon the world through an empty cyclopean aperture from a point inside our heads that obviously is surrounded by body tissues on all sides? Well, here's the solution. As we saw in the robot example, whatever parts of the body are within the field of view of the camera of our eyes are automatically included in the visual mapping of the world inside the brain's reality model. However, oh, like other objects, the body is mapped in perspectival relation to the perceptual ego center and veridically represented as visually opaque, of course, like any other object. Here's my hand. I can't see through it. However, in the vicinity of the ego center itself, persistence in the veridic veridical representation of the body as visually opaque would place a wall of opaque body tissue representations between the ego center and the visual neural world of the reality space, Rendering, rendering us effectively blind. In this mapping quandary, the brain has an option regarding the design of a model neural body that is not realizable in a physical body, namely the introduction of a neural fiction cast in the format of naive realism of a cyclopean aperture in the neural body wall through which the ego center is inf interfaced 
with the visual world model from its position inside the head. Elementary and convenient indeed. So we get this. Physical body situation, impossible to look from there. Neural body situation, a great convenience to look from there. To my mind, the fact that we actually experience the physically impossible, namely looking out upon the world from a point inside our heads, constitutes proof, proof positive that the body we experience ourselves as inhabiting is the neural body inside the brain's reality space. And that in turn assures me that this bit of mine for a paradigm for consciousness deserves serious consideration, or I would like to hear what alternative explanation you have to offer for this most fundamental fact of our sensory phenomenology. That most fundamental fact, the point in space from which we look and experience, is what defines the first person perspective of the conscious state. That then is my answer to Stephen Harnad's challenge for the Summer in Institute. My account has of necessity been highly compressed and cursory, but its details are on their way into print in the following two publications. And I thank you for your attention.